We are in Daniel chapter 11. And especially we have been looking at how very precise this chapter is. Daniel 11 is so precise that in the past liberal theologians have questioned its validity as a book of prophecy and have rather said that it is more a historical record of what was of what had happened. We have seen that God is a God of omniscience. We have seen also that God is such a big God that He is able to well reveal to His servants the prophets about things that are yet to come. Sometimes they are a few years down the line. Sometimes they are centuries down the line. Sometimes they are a couple of hundred years down the line, but it, nevertheless, God is faithful, God speaks and God reveals. Amen. Praise God. Daniel chapter 11, please. And we are going to continue from where we stopped last week. We have seen up till verse 14, but how very, very terrible Israel had to struggle and suffer because of the wrong choices she made. As Syria and Egypt, one to the north of her, one to the south of her, continually were at war. And now the scripture tells us in verse 15, So the king of the north shall come and cast up a mount and take the most fenced cities, and the arms of the south shall not withstand, neither his chosen people, neither shall there be any strength to withstand. Now verses 15 and 16 is talking about a victory that was wrought by the king of the north. Like I shared with you last Saturday morning, the king of the north and the king of the south is talking about north of Israel and to the south of Israel. To the north of Israel was Syria, to the south of Israel was Egypt and it's still the same. And as these two nations kept warring with one another, there was so much of pain and so much of hardship. And now we are looking at the king of the north coming and casting up a mount. Now history records the victory that Antiochus the Great had over Egypt. The arms of the south shall not withstand. It's talking about Egypt. Egypt will not be able to withstand this king from the north. History talks about this king as Antiochus the Great. Now the reason I'm sharing with you on history is because there are good Bible encyclopedias. You may note down the names if you will. You get an opportunity to get them, please do. Hastings and the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia. Now they record exactly for us what happened during this time period. And this is about 125 years of prophecy that was literally fulfilled. So we are looking at real accuracy. But he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will. And none shall stand before him. And he shall stand in the glorious land. Now that's talking about Jerusalem and Israel. Which by his hand shall be consumed. So we are looking at how Israel was sandwiched between two warring factions and had to pay for it. The phrase glorious land is talking about the land of ornament or goodly land, referring very, very specifically to Israel. Now verse 17, He shall also set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom and upright ones with him. Thus shall he do. And he shall give him the daughter of women, corrupting her. But she shall not stand on his side, neither be for him. Now this brings us to about the year 195 BC, when Antiochus the Great made a treaty with Egypt. What treaty was that? Again a marriage treaty. When he gave his daughter Cleopatra to Ptolemy Epiphanes in marriage. So we see history, although it is 
happening as though people are following their own choices is really a fulfillment of everything that God sees, perceives and anticipates. Hallelujah! Whatever happens even today, people may think that they are warring against somebody else or they are, you know, rising up in arrogance against God. God's already seen it. God's already perceived it. He has already anticipated it and He has taken whatever action He needs to take. Hallelujah. Every man is just fulfilling God's plan and eternal purposes. Hallelujah. They may think that they are doing something. They are not doing nothing. They are just fulfilling God's plan and purpose. And although we don't like to use that analogy about the great chessboard, we are just seeing how man, even though he exercises the power of will, his free choice, what he is really doing without his knowledge is accomplishing God's overall, overall plan and purpose for mankind. Hallelujah. Even in the midst of evil, we see God's not taken by surprise. He has already foreseen it. He has already seen everything about it. So here in verse 17, he shall give him the daughter of women. He's talking about his daughter, Cleopatra, who was given to Ptolemy Epiphanes in marriage. Then verse 18 to 20. After this shall he turn his face unto the isles. Now this is talking about Antiochus the Great. He turned his face unto the isles. The isles is referring to Greece, Europe and all the Greek islands. And shall take many, but a prince for his own behalf shall cause the reproach offered by him to cease. Without his own reproach, he shall cause it to turn upon him. So what happens is, we are seeing Antiochus the Great. He is not only trying to come into an alliance with the Ptolemies in Egypt, but he is also turning westward. His gaze is going towards the Greek islands. And the Greek islands were ruled by Lysimachus, one of the generals of Alec Alexander. Now a prince of his own behalf refers to another line. Someone similar to him. And that is referring to Rome. Now we are seeing how Rome starts emerging on the scene. Rome was beginning to rise from the west and move towards the east. Now how did Rome become powerful? Rome became powerful because of exacting taxes from the Syrians. So as Rome began to rise, she was building a tremendous empire by taxing the people she was capturing and Syria was one among them. That's why the Bible says, the reproach offered him by him to cease. For his own behalf shall cause the reproach offered by him to cease. Without his own reproach he shall cause it to turn upon him. Now, the aggression of Antiochus the Great was met head on by another upcoming empire, which was Rome. And Rome taxed the Syrians, brought the Syrians into captivity. Now as the Syrians began to fall before Rome, many historical details happened. Let's see what happened. Verse 19, 20, 21. Then he shall turn his face towards the fort of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. That's talking about Antiochus the Great. Then shall stand up in his state a racer of taxes, Rome, in the glory of the kingdom. How accurate the prophecy is because Rome became powerful only because of taxation. We read about it even in the gospel of Matthew. How Rome was exacting taxes upon Israel. Okay, a raiser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom, but within few days he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle. And in his state, estate shall stand up a wild person, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom. Now, after Antiochus the Great, we are now 
being introduced to a wild person. Now most of these kings were wicked men. But this person who will rise up will be wild. He will be a typological representation of the Antichrist who is to come. That's why we are seeing history as well as prophecy in Daniel chapter 11. We are seeing two things there. Please mark it down. He will be a wild person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom. This is talking about Antiochus Epiphanes who was king of Syria. Antiochus Epiphanes. He was called the little horn in chapter 8. He is of the line of the Seleucid dynasty. He came to the throne in 175 BC. And the most important thing is he came to the throne. How did he come to the throne? But he shall come in peaceably. That's how the Antichrist will someday come as a great bringer of peace. So please mark it down. This man, Antiochus Epiphanes, is a typological representation of the Antichrist. He shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries, lies. This is how the Antichrist will also do someday, not too far from today. Verses 22 and 24. And by the ar and with the arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him and shall be broken. He also the prince of the covenant. Now not only will he get the kingdom by peace and flatteries, but this man is going to make himself strong against Israel. The prince of the covenant is referring in all probability, Bible scholars tell us, to the high priest, Onias the third, O-N-I-A-S, Onias the third, who was deposed as high priest and murdered during the time of Antiochus Epiphanes. Soon after he came to power. So the prince of the covenant is talking about an Israelite. A high priest of God. Because we are talking about covenant. And after the league made with him. He shall work deceitfully. For he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. He shall enter peaceably. Even upon the fattest places of the province. And he shall do that which his fathers have not done nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey and spoil and riches. A, and he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds even for a time. Talking about deceit. And he shall stir up his power and his courage. Now these verses describe the campaign of Antiochus. And he shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army. And the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army. But he shall not stand. That means Egypt would be destroyed because before Antiochus Epiphanes. History records that it happened. For they shall focus devices against him. The Bible is talking about how this man succeeds. This man succeeds not only by peace and deceit, but he is backed by the forces of darkness. Please mark it down. Every time you see unclean men rule a nation, it's at a point of a time when the forces of darkness literally aid that particular individual to be raised up for a particular time period to rule over a nation, to bring it into darkness and unrighteousness. That's what the Bible is saying will happen during the time of Antiochus Epiphanes. We have already seen earlier about this man. He will be aided by unclean spirits. Okay. A. They that feed of the portion of his meat shall destroy him and his army shall overflow and many shall fall down slain. And both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief, and they shall speak lies at one table. 
That means they will sit at one table, conference table, and they will speak lies to one another. King of Egypt, Antiochus Epiphanes, that's what we see happening even today. There's so much of uncleanness in the land, and there are politicians who say there's nothing happening. Those are isolated incidents that are happening. There are isolated incidents. There are terrible things that are happening in the land because of uncleanness. And because of darkness trying to get a hold over this nation. And it's time for the church to stand strong and to be bold. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. It's when the church keeps quiet and you know it becomes more of a survival tactic. That you find that the church suffers and is at the receiving end. But if the church stands tall in the midst of darkness. Stands tall for righteousness. And it's a church that prays through, we will see results. Hallelujah. Now here's this man, Antiochus. He's sitting in line along with this arch enemy, the ruler of Egypt. But it shall not prosper, for yet the end shall be at the time appointed. Then shall he return into his land with great riches. History records that it happened. When Antiochus came back from Egypt, he brought with him all the riches of Egypt with him. And his heart shall be against the holy covenant. That means he'll hate God's people. He'll hate the covenant. Anytime you see a man rising up against the church. Or rising up against the work of the Lord. He's hating covenant. You see it all the time. There are people in the nation. It may look like they're just doing it against one small you know, missionary church. In, in, a, in, in the north of India. But what they are really doing is they are coming up against the God of the covenant who established that work. And that's what this man is doing. Antiochus Epiphanes is against the covenant. He's, he'll have, he, he shall be against the holy covenant and he shall do exploits and return to his own land. Now, in verses 29 onwards... We are seeing, at the time appointed he shall return and come towards the south. That means there will be a second campaign, a second war he will fight against the king of Egypt. But it shall not be as the former or as the latter. For the sh ships of Shittim shall come against him. Now, the second campaign, history tells us, was not a success because of the ships of Shittim. The ships of Shittim is talking about the navy of Rome. It's talking about a definite naval blockade that came against this man, Antiochus Epiphanes, that made him not as successful as he was the first time. Remember the first time he just overran Egypt. But the second time, the ships of Shittim came up against him. So his campaign was not a success. Therefore he shall be grieved and return. And have indignation against the holy covenant. Now his anger and frustration is turned against Palestine. Which is caught in between these two nations. So he hates the covenant. He hates the covenant people. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them. That forsake the holy covenant. It means, because he is a covenant hater, he becomes a covenant breaker. He breaks his covenant with Israel and he shall have intelligence with them. It talks about certain Jews who will betray their people to this man, Antiochus Epiphanes. Talking about betrayers. Please mark it down. There will be people who will betray the covenant. They will betray their own people to save their lives. Verse 31, an arm shall stand on his part and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength and shall take away the daily sacrifice and they shall place the ab abomination that maketh desolate. The abomination that maketh desolate literally means the abomination that astonisheth. It will be an astonishment or an eye-opener to the Jews. 
Now Antiochus came against Jerusalem in 170 BC, at which time over one lakh Jews were killed. It was a time of great bloodshed. So today one lakh may not be much, but at that time one lakh was a lot. One lakh Jews were killed because he broke covenant. Not only did he do that, he took away the daily sacrifice from the temple. He shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. That's talking about the temple in Jerusalem. He took away the daily sacrifice from the temple and instead of that offered the blood and broth of a swine or a pig upon the altar. And then in the temple at Jerusalem he set up an image of Jupiter to be worshipped in the holy place in the temple of God. Now that's what he did. That's the phrase the abomination that make a desolate why are we studying this in detail because sometime in the not too distant future the antichrist will do similarly he'll just do what antiochus epiphanes did earlier remember all through the bible we read about types and figures you see a type in the old testament you will find the person in the New Testament. I'll give you an example. Joseph is a type of Jesus Christ. Why? Because Joseph was sold for silver. Jesus was sold for silver. Joseph was betrayed by his own brethren. Jesus was betrayed by his own friend. Joseph was in prison. And then he was brought out of it. It's a typological presentation of how Jesus would be in prison for some time and then be raised from the dead. Hallelujah. So you see types and symbols in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament. And this is part of it. We are seeing Antiochus Epiphanes, the little horn of chapter 8, will be the type of the Antichrist who is to come, who will the an be the anti-type. He will be the fulfillment of everything that Antiochus did and was and such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits now this verse incidentally is not found in the Tamil Bible especially it's not written like this but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits so I want you to mark it down in your English Bibles because this is one scripture, the latter half of which we can hold on to by faith and claim. Amen. Now verse 32 tells us that there will be some people in the nation of Israel who will play the role of Judas. But there will be also a certain remnant whom God will raise up to do exploits. Now that's how God operates all the time. Even in the midst of the most darkest periods of church history, God has always been faithful to raise up few who would hold the gospel flame alive and who will not recant on their faith. Hallelujah. It's happened all through history, all through church history. When there's been great groups of people, great denominational people who have been walking in darkness, there have always been the few who have said that just shall live by faith. Hallelujah. And we have always seen God honor those people, take those people, use them. It happened, then it will happen now again. But follow carefully, this is what happened. What happened in verse 32 is that God raised up a family called the Maccabees. You will read about them in the book of, uh, books, in some of the books of the Apocrypha. The Maccabees were raised up. Now the word Maccabees means hammer. And these people were raised up to be a people who would stand for God. Now although some of what we read happened during their time period is found placed in the Apocrypha by Bible scholars. You must know and understand that they were God's men for that hour. Amen. The only reason why we place the book of Maccabees with the Apocrypha books is because they are of historical value rather than of spiritual value. Amen. But they are not lies. 
they are true incidents and records of what happened during this very very terrible time in which there were thousands upon thousands of israelites who were killed for no reason but for their faith alone now these people were led by a person called matathias matathias m a t t a t h i a s he was a high priest in the year 166 bc who joined with his family called the maccabees and who revolted against antiochus epiphanes so they were god's men for that terrible hour and they that understand among the people shall instruct many yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame by captivity and by spoil many days that means people will go to the word and yet there will be still a lot of blood shed now when they shall fall they shall be hopen with a little help but many shall cleave to them with flatteries there were many people who chose to go with antiochus epiphanes but there was few who like the family of the maccabees who stayed together and who fought antiochus epiphanes and some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white even to the time of the end because it is yet for a time appointed now the time of the end is now moving centuries from what antiochus epiphanes did it's jumping to the time when the antichrist will be raised up the time of the end mark that phrase it's not talking of the end of time i've already explained it to you i'm not going to repeat it again the time of the end is talking about the time of the end of that prophecy referring specifically to the last week the 70th week of daniel remember 69 weeks are already over there's only one week of 7 years yet to be accomplished and that is not too far from the time in which we are living in so now verse 35 is a projection of prophecy it's moving from history or the time period of antiochus epiphanes to the time period of the antichrist so again prophecy begins verse 36 and the king shall do according to his will and he shall exalt himself this is talking about the antichrist and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished for that that is determined shall be done neither shall he regard the god of his fathers verse 37 nor the desire of women nor regard any god for he shall magnify himself above all now since we are dealing with antiochus epiphanes and we are dealing with what happened during his time period this verse 36 indicates that the antichrist will rise up out of the geographical bounds of the ancient grecian empire and there will be two people who will come that we understand from reading the book of revelation but you can just write it down there will be a political antichrist there will also be a spiritual antichrist or a religious antichrist two people one is called the antichrist that's talking about the political one the other is referred to as the false prophet remember antioch antiochus epiphanes was from syria so the political one will be a gentile raised up out of the fallen roman empire okay the religious one will be like the ones who were during the time of antiochus epiphanes 
the ones who broke covenant, the ones who joined to get themselves together with Antiochus, the religious one, the false prophet, will in all probability be a Jew. That's why sometimes when people say that Antichrist is the Pope, well, it's wrong for us to give bland statements like that. Amen. We need to know exactly from how prophecy is to be interpreted and how prophecy is something that is already shown as a typology that will bring forth fulfillment later exactly in the same pattern, the same way. So the false prophet is a religious leader and he will in all probability be someone who will rise up out of... He will be like a wolf in sheep's clothing. Let's read Revelation chapter 13, please. Remember all Bible truth is parallel. Revelation 13 verses 11 and 12. And I beheld another beast coming out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. It's talking about a religious beast. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So he will be someone who, ex who exercises spiritual power. He will be someone who will be so powerful that he is able to convince Israel that the Antichrist is the Messiah. Or else Israel will not be convinced if a religious man stands to talk to them. Amen. You go and tell a Jew, you are a Christian leader, you go and tell a Jew, Christ is the Messiah, he is not going to believe you. But if one among them, a rabbi would stand up to talk something, then there would be people who would listen. That's why this man, the false prophet, is a backslidden Jew. Now the Antichrist is given many names in scripture. I'd like to just mention a few of them. Because we're going to be seeing what he will do in verse 36-37. He's called the son of perdition. That's his name. The son of perdition. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3 calls him that. Then he is also called the lawless one. He is also called the lawless one. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 8. Then he is referred to as the beast. He is referred to as the beast. Revelation chapter 13 verse 1. Then the king of a fierce countenance, Daniel 8.23. All this is a revelation to us of his nature and character. Sometimes you may be wondering why are we spending so much time talking about somebody who we are not going to meet. Well, if we know who he is and what he is like, it fuels the desire in us for us to reach out to the ones in our own families and the ones we know, to get them saved and into the kingdom of God. Amen. Okay. He is also called the desolator. Daniel 9.27 The man of the earth. Psalm 10 verse 18. Psalm 10 verse 18. The man of the earth. And in Isaiah 22 verse 5, he is called the nail. The nail. N-A-I-L. 
nail. Verse 36, it says, he shall do according to his will. That means he is a self-willed man. That's why he's called the Antichrist. Christ said, my will is to do the will of the Father. This man will do what he wills. You see a man doing what he wills all the time, that man is a self-willed man. That's the spirit of an Antichrist. Amen. A man who says, no, I'll do my own will. I am the master of my destiny, captain of my choices. My ship is heading the direction I want it to head. My friends, the man is a self-willed man. That's the spirit of the Antichrist. Look here very carefully in Daniel chapter 11 verse 36. And this king shall do according to his will. So he is the exact opposite of Jesus. John 5.30 tells us, I came to do the will of my father. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. How very unlike he is to Christ. He wants worship. Christ never wanted worship in that level. He humbled himself, took upon himself the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men. Philippians 2 verses 5 to 8. He magnifies himself above every God. Reference to that is found in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 4. Revelation chapter 13 verse 8. That means every worship you see today is geared towards that man one day manifesting himself. It's amazing. But there are religions in this world who are waiting for someone who will come riding on a white horse. They have names for the person. They are looking forward to that person with great anticipation. So you must understand that this man when he comes with flatteries has already prepared the way for worship of the entire world to be directed towards him by the various religions of this world. Every religion is geared towards this person's manifestation someday. That's why he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god of this world. And shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods. Speak marvelous things is not talking positively. It's talking in a negative sense. It's talking about this man bragging against the god of heaven. The god of all creation. And he shall prosper. Till the indignation be accomplished. For that, that is determined shall be done. Now in Romans chapter 8 verses 7 and 8 we read of the carnal mind of men. The carnal mind of men will be turned towards this one man. All of a sudden he will be like a superman. It will look like he will have the answer to the world's problems. And he shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. That means he will have brief success. It will happen during the last half of Daniel's 70th week. Three and, three and a half years, the last half of it will be years of great deception. Today you may wonder, with all the kind of, you know, mindset that people have, intelligence, vast advances in science and information technology, will every man really obey this man? Will every man be duped? Well, you must understand that behind this man stands the entire forces of darkness. Every force of darkness that brings people into subjection today to form a religion and religious worship will on that day choose to make those people believe this delusion. They will believe. They will worship him. And if they don't, he has his own means of making them do it. That's what we read in Revelation 13. The mark is put on the forehead. The mark is put on the hand. No man can buy and sell without that mark. Terrible. It's going to be terrible times. So this will happen in the last half of Daniel's 70th week. 
verse 37. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers. Okay. Now this may be like uh, confusion. You are talking about the Antichrist. He is coming from Rome. But he is not regarding the God of the fathers. The God of the fathers is specifically directly linked to Yahweh. Is it a paradox that it is talking about this? No, it is not a paradox. Remember when, it's, when we are looking at the Antichrist, we are looking at two men. One, the Antichrist will be the political leader. The other one is the false prophet. I told you he will be a Jew. He will not regard the God of his fathers. That means he is not going to believe one bit in Yahweh. Today we have groups of people like that even in Israel today who don't believe in the orthodox faith of Yahweh. They don't. They call themselves, you know, modern Jews. They don't believe in anything of the Bible. They think it's just some big mumbo jumbo. All this thing about sacrifice and everything. Yesterday again in Animal Planet, we were looking at the difference between goats and sheep. And the difference between goats and sheep, so the narrator said, was something that stems from the Bible where we find Jesus is addressed as the Lamb of God who died for the sins of mankind. Now how much more clearer can someone be when they are trying to get this gospel across? I mean you need to be as dumb as a goat not to hear it. But if you are a sheep you will hear what the word is saying. <laughs> Amen. Well it's there. You, 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 you can't really hide this gospel. You can't put it under a bushel and try to hide its light. It's going to penetrate into this world. Anyhow, God will choose the method, His method. He'll put to shame the, the intelligences of the world. Now look, look at this very carefully. It says, He will not regard the God of His fathers. Okay, always keep in mind Revelation chapter 13 is talking about two men. The Antichrist and the false prophet. Now, he will not, or nor the desire of women. Please mark it down. There is also a chance that the Antichrist will be like sometimes people make it look he will be a homosexual but if you look at this word not the desire of women it goes further farther than you know someone's sexual orientation please mark it down the desire of women was referring to the desire of every hebrew woman to be the mother of the messiah every woman in those days when mary was around, wish that she would be the mother of the Messiah. Remember, Israel was so oppressed during the intertestamental period that there was a great expectation among young women in those days that the Messiah would be born through them and would come into the world. So the desire of women is talking much more than just the sexual orientation of this one man. It's talking about the desire of women which was Jesus Christ. He will not regard the desire of women. That means Jesus Christ will be totally rejected by this man. Some people believe that he may be a leader who comes out. The false prophet may not be a Jew. He may be a man who is from organized denominational Christendom. But whatever it is, because the desire of women is more from this verse, they think maybe he will be from an organized Christian sect of people. But let's just read on. Nor regard any God. That means he rejects Jesus Christ. He rejects Yahweh. And does not regard any God. For he shall magnify himself above all. So the Antichrist leads a rebellion against God. And he is aided in it by the false prophet. Let's read Psalm 2, verses 2 and 3. Sometimes we don't know how many 
place this talks about the end times what is there the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the lord and against his anointed saying let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us that means he's talking about total rebellion he is leading a total rebellion against god he will oppose all religions and he will promote worship of himself in other words anything that promotes ecumenical movements or ecumenism is of the anti christ what is ecumenism one religion for one world so when you find certain groups of christian people and leaders joining ecumenical movements you must understand that it is not from god it is from the anti christ it is not from god god has nothing to do with that one religion for one world finally he shall magnify himself above all says he will make himself god he will make himself religion everything that he is is unclean everything that he is projects the devil and the devil's desire for the world to fall at his feet rather than at the feet of jesus let's read revelation chapter 13 verses 15 to 17 please and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed he causeth all both small and great rich and poor free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads and that no man might buy or sell save he that at the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name greatest tragedy is that anyone who receives this mark is forever marked against god there's no redemption after that point to refuse the mark is to die as a martyr to accept the mark whether in reluctance is to acknowledge his lordship over your life that's why we're looking at it many many years ago the last verse was 18 was used by cinema producers to bring out movies that represented uncleanness which would be you know typified by the usage of that number 666 well people played more emphasis on the number rather than the message behind that number what is 666 actually talking about it is talking about just like seven talks about the fullness of the godhead it's talking about the complete perversion of man three sixes talking about the complete perversion of man that means this one man who so possessed by lucifer himself will bring out everything that is vile about the base nature of a man that's why anyone who takes that mark on his forehead or his right hand is marked forever against god almighty that's number one number two it's only those people who get that mark who will be able to buy or sell that means any economical transaction that will happen during that time period will be made possible only if you have that mark means he will control everything you can't buy sugar you can't buy rice you can't buy any cereals you want something they'll ask you as the mark already you find nations are progressively moving towards it it's already happening national boundaries are being slowly cast aside the people are saying no we'll have one nation we'll have one currency we'll have you know one ruler slowly it's happening people are moving towards it advanced nations are accepting it so when this is really brought into force 
this will be enforced correctly like the Bible says it will. Let's read verse 38. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces. The word God of forces is in Hebrew Mausim M-A-U Z-I-M which means God's protectors or munitions. That means he will be a fighting man. He will worship violence. He will worship the weapons of war. Some translate it as the God of fortresses. We we'll look at that next Saturday morning. But it's talking about so many things that are involved in pagan worship. That's why we unashamedly tell people, Mariolatry is sin. Amen. The worship of Mary is sin. It is as good as any kind of idol worship. It is sin because it has nothing to do with God and God has nothing to do with that kind of worship. When you look at it next Saturday morning, you will understand what this God of the fortresses mean. Very amazing. But when people turn their attention away from the living God, the Bible says God gives them over to delusions. They begin to believe a lie. And in believing the lie, they sell themselves over to Satan completely. That's why we preach the gospel. We give every man a fair chance to accept Jesus into his or her life. Hallelujah. Amen. That's the choice every man faces. You either say yes to God or you say no to God. But if you say yes to God, there is blessing. Life eternal. Life in abundance. The assurance of eternal life today and now. Hallelujah. Praise God.